Good morning. I'm Becky. I'm a midwife at Generations, and this is Becca. She's Hi. also a midwife at Generations. Um, and this morning, we're going to talk about low milk supply. So, if you have any questions about it, or want to chat about any of the myths and facts um, or remedies that we're going to be talking about, please leave us lots of comments. So, we're going to start by talking about some myths of low milk supply, or why people think they have low milk supply, or how you can sort of work your way into a low milk supply um, by mismanaging your breastfeeding experience. So, Becca will. So I'll get started. So um, often, usually the first reason why women think that they their milk supply isn't uh, adequate is because uh, their baby is feeding all the time. So they go through periods of feeding where a uh, baby only wants to be at the breast, and and it's it's pretty logical that we think that uh, yeah, they, they, there isn't enough there. They just keep wanting to go back, uh, back and forth and back and forth. Um, but there are some really smart things about why babies do this. Um, babies are meant to be frequent nurses. They're meant to uh, nurse all the time. And, and breastfeeding is really a supply and demand thing. So this is just their way of being able to ask for more and, and signal your body to start making more milk. So it, it uh, but it's really disconcerting and it tends to happen mostly during growth spurts. Um, and so three weeks, six weeks, three months, six months tend to be the big growth spurt times, although growth spurts can happen in, at any point in time around those, those, those ages. Um, and, uh, or, you know, so certainly sometimes too, if babies are feeling quite crummy or under the weather, they're going to want to be nursing a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And physical growth spurts, as well as, you know, mental leaps and developmental growth spurts, mm -hmm. they like to nurse through those too. Um, and also breastfeeding is about more than nutrition. So it's a comfort source for your baby. Um, so those are lots of reasons that, that babies will eat a lot and it's not because you have low milk supply. Um, another reason people think that they have low milk supply is that they're not able to pump very much. Sometimes um, your body just doesn't respond to a pump. It's a piece of plastic and not your baby. Your baby is much more efficient than a pump is, so your baby is likely getting more um, and usually an adequate amount just by breastfeeding um, rather than what you're getting from your pump. So what we know that we need for, for breastfeeding and for, um, for our milk letdown is oxytocin. So that's one of those love hormones. And, and uh, someone will experience letdowns or leaking when they hear their baby cry or other babies cry. And so sometimes for women who are pumping a lot, it can be helpful to have a picture of your baby or a video of your baby on your phone that you can look at um, to be able to help induce that uh, oxytocin letdown. Uh, because sometimes that's all that's lacking is just your, your body's ability to to really get comfortable and, and let that oxytocin flow. Mm -hmm. Shirts or blankets are also nice that smell like your baby. Yes, not that the puppy ones. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, some women uh, feel like they don't have enough milk supply because their breasts no longer feel full. So for women who have breastfed before, you'll probably remember the time uh, in the early breastfeeding, in the early, early postpartum uh, where you experience some engorgement. And it can take a while for your breast, um, for your breast milk supply and your breasts to figure out the, the amount of milk that's needed. And so Often in the first few weeks, once your milk has come in, women tend to feel quite full and quite heavy. Um, if babies have had any longer stretches between feeds, um, uh, then you know some of them just feel uncomfortably full. But that goes away, and it it's not necessarily a reflection of your supply and how much milk there is. It's a reflection of the lymph system and and our whole our whole body's adjusting to the milk. Um, and so it, that settles out over time. Our bodies figure out quite smartly how much milk our babies need and how much milk our babies are asking for. And so you lose that feeling of fullness without losing the supply. Your body just gets really smart um, about not overproducing too much, not overproducing and not underproducing, but just getting the right amount. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people also think that they're not making enough milk because their babies won't sleep through the night. So we have somehow come up with this myth in our culture that babies sleep through the night. <laughs> sleep like a baby is not a thing. <laughs> you do not want to sleep like a baby. Um, it is normal for babies to wake up through the night. It's protective for them. It's protective against SIDS. Um, so there are, you know, the rare babies that do sleep through the night from the get-go, but they are the exception and not the rule. Um, it's good for your baby to wake up in the night. It means that you're feeding your baby enough um, and that nighttime milk production is really important. And it also is important to prevent you getting back your period. Um, so that feeding through the night is a good thing. You just have to embrace it. Yes. <laughs> it. 
accept it as a reality <laughs> and, and learn to side lie. And, and there's also a myth out there too that giving your baby formula at night will help them mm. sleep longer, which isn't always the case. Um, and so we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on when, when we talk about kind of management of breastfeeding. Um, but it, it's a big myth that giving your baby formula will, will help them to sleep longer in the night. Um, uh, so keep your baby close by to you in the night in a bassinet beside your bed. We're going to talk about kind of co-sleeping in another Facebook live, but keeping your baby close means breastfeeding is easier um, and you're less wakeful if you're not having to get up and go to another room or to another chair, kind of feeding your baby in bed at night uh, with your baby close by. Um, leaking. Some women feel like they're, maybe their supplies drop because they're no longer leaking. Some women don't leak in the first place, or some women may have leaking breasts and not have enough milk. Um, so the amount of leaking that does or does not happen really certainly uh, doesn't reflect anything on, on the supply that you have um, and the amount of milk that your baby is getting. Uh, it's just one of those really fun things that makes, you know, public, <laughs> public thing. <laughs> Challenging without big breast pads. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when other babies cry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let down. Some people think that they don't have enough milk because um, they have stopped feeling or have never felt a letdown. Letdowns can feel a lot of different ways. Some people get really thirsty when they feel let down. Some people feel a tingling or a sort of shooting, I don't know, how would you shock almost? <laughs> I describe my letdown as fire ants crawling up my breasts. <laughs> Or glass shards being shoved into my nipples. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> Letdowns for me were not a pleasant experience, but thankfully they're quick. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's true. Usually you only feel that first big letdown of mm -hmm. the feed if you feel it at all, mm -hmm. and it it doesn't mean that you know your baby is not getting enough or not eating uh, if you don't feel those letdowns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Enjoy those. <laughs> <laughs> You will get multiple letdowns in a feed, mm -hmm. um, and so in a good feed, you know your baby should have uh, a, a, more than one letdown in in a feed, and you'll get them on the on both sides, uh, both in both breasts at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so again, other reasons why women feel that uh, that their babies aren't getting enough, or that they might not have enough supply for their uh, milk supply for their babes, is really that frequent nursing and the the fussiness. Lots and lots and lots of babies will be fussy in the evening. It's um, there are a lot of reasons around it. There, are, and the way I usually describe it to parents is, how do you feel at five o'clock in the afternoon after a long day? <laughs> right, our our days are full of lights and sounds and people that we might not want to be around. Um, we might be being, you know, babies are carted around, baby and. Uh, uh, not necessarily to their liking. So tends to be at the end of the day, there's what we typically call a witching hour, um, where babies are just fussy and, and they want to be comforted. And often they'll stay at the breast and they'll go back and forth to the breast. Sometimes this can be helpful in filling their bellies for a good first sleep of the night. Um, sometimes it doesn't mean anything at all other than your baby wants you and wants to be comforted by you. Um, it really has nothing to do with supply. I learned something in reading Becky's research on low milk <laughs> supply that your milk supply doesn't change throughout the day and I've been telling people that all along um, because I thought the prolactin levels followed our circadian rhythm. I also thought that. I know. Apparently <laughs> it's not a thing. I'm really sorry to anyone I ever said that to. I've definitely said that before. I yeah. Um, wrote this. <laughs> but it's not a thing. Um, but it is a thing that that babies are just overstimulated at the end of the day mm -hmm. like the rest of us are and so want to hunker down and get ready for a good night's sleep and we'll feed and feed and feed and feed um it's just going to tell your body that your baby's getting milk it needs and maybe wants a little bit more but it's not an abnormal thing and it's no indication that your baby's not getting enough um, so we're going to talk a little bit about causes of low milk supply. Um, there are a lot of different factors that go into making enough milk for your baby. Um, and even when things are managed perfectly, sometimes people just don't make enough milk. And that can be really hard for folks and really it can feel really tragic if your plan is to breastfeed exclusively. Um, but we'll talk about, you know, things that, that can be done and how to manage those feelings of, of disappointment and grief later on too. So, so one of the things um, that help can help ensure a good milk supply is really allowing your baby access to the breast whenever they want it. Um, we are put on baby's schedule from the time we get pregnant. We don't have to decide when 
vomit in our pregnancies or uh, when we need to empty our bladders every two hours in the night, which helps prepare us for getting up often in the night for feeding. Um, what, uh, so what's really important is really allowing your baby access to the breast. Um, babies need at least eight to 12 feeds a day. Uh, in, the first, in the first week of life, 12 is great because it's just, you're gonna build a really great supply. And so, you know, saying to your baby, you can't be hungry, you were just feeding half an hour ago. You know, I'll, I'll just put a soother in your mouth instead. Or it, it could likely be that your baby is hungry and your baby is asking for you to make more milk. Mm -hmm. So really allowing open access to the breast and frequent, frequent, frequent feeds. Babies have tiny, tiny, tiny tummies to start. So the stomach is the size of a chickpea when they're born. That's really small. It doesn't take much to fill, but it also doesn't take long to empty. And so these babies need frequent feeds. Um, so often uh, in the first, especially in the first couple of weeks, babies might be eating every hour to three hours. Every now and then they'll have a longer stretch, but offering your baby food whenever they're um, asking for it. And sometimes it's, I think it's really important to identify the, your baby's feeding cues. Because what can happen is if we're not feeding our babies regularly enough and we're missing their cues, then they get hangry. So by the time that they're crying for food, that's hanger, right? That's, that's the, the beginning steps of cues um, are usually quite subtle. You know, babies are mouthing things. They, they just want to put anything in their mouth. Um, you'll start hearing them make sounds. They might be smacking their lips. These are some early signs. And so the sooner you can get baby to the breast, the eat more easily that baby will get to the breast because when you're hangry, it's hard to do things. Mm -hmm. um, and including sometimes for babies to get a good latch and to settle well at the breast. Mm -hmm. So catching your baby's cues early, um, keeping your baby, uh, allowing your baby to get to the breast as often as needed. That's one of the reasons we recommend a lot of skin to skin in the early days is because your baby's already there um, right next to the breast so it makes it easy to catch that and disrupted skin to skin within the first hour of birth is one of the reasons um, or one of the things that can cause low milk supply or disrupt milk supply because that baby isn't getting latched on right away. Um, it's not something that folks usually have a lot of control over. Um, at least typically in midwifery care, we, we bring babies skin to skin as long as everybody is well um, and as quickly as possible. So it's it's not necessarily something you have control over, but if, um, if it's not in your birth plan, it's a good thing to have in your birth plan is to have that immediate skin to skin um, that brings your bacteria to your baby. It puts your baby in the right spot to breastfeed um, and all sorts of important cues happen between you and your baby as in that first hour, um, or the first two hours really after the baby is born. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that can affect birth supply is contraception or and sometimes other medications, but more commonly contraception. So the birth control pill um, has been shown quite clearly to decrease milk supply. Um, and so for women who have just a borderline good supply anyway, um, taking the birth control pill can sometimes significantly affect how much your baby is getting and and create the need for supplementing your baby um, there are uh, other options out there for birth control um, and there is what's called a mini pill which is a uh, hormonal birth control like the birth control pill but with uh, fewer hormones uh, so it has a, a little bit of a, a lighter effect or less of an effect on your milk supply. Mm -hmm. The only problem with it is it's a little bit more picky. And so these are these are types of things that you need to take at the same time every day. And for any of you who have had newborns already, you can understand well probably, but the, the same time every day doesn't ever happen. <laughs> which, <laughs> which for anything, which which leads to more babies when mm -hmm. maybe you didn't want more babies. Um, so I would definitely say uh, for those women who are seeking birth control while breastfeeding, look at some other options um, to be able to help uh, keep that supply going for your babe. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we're going to talk a bit about circumstances surrounding birth. This is another thing that folks um, don't have a lot of control over. Having a birth plan that supports lactation is important, um, but sometimes things go, don't go to plan and, and we know that and, and mums know that. Um, so one of the things that can contribute to low milk supply is a surgical birth, so a C-section. Um, delays in lactation are really common with C-sections. We usually see milk come in, uh, the mature milk sort of colostrum transition into mature milk around day three and that often happens um, uh, sort of day three to day five really more for, for cesarean sections and sometimes even later um, especially if it's your first baby. So there are a few reasons for that but the surgery itself um, seems to cause, oh, cause the hormone surges to happen differently. Um, 
after after the surgery. So oxytocin and prolactin, um, women have different values of those hormones in their blood after a surgical birth and after a vaginal birth. Um, babies born by C-section also tend to transfer less milk initially than their vaginally born counterparts. So that shifts over time, but that, those initial struggles um, can can complicate a long-term milk supply and can cause a lower milk supply initially and um, introduce supplementing, which then also can further lower the milk supply. So it's a bit of a cascade. Mm -hmm. And there are there are also, um, we have noticed too, or we have research showing that um, any kind of assisted birth, so even vacuum and forceps sometimes can, um, it can disrupt anyway that first little time after birth. Sometimes uh, it can be injuries to the baby uh, from a traumatic birth. Uh, sometimes it can be babies need, oftentimes when we're using interventions, it's because there are concerns with the baby's well-being. So these babies are more likely to need resuscitation and resuscitation gets in that way of that first hour of skin to skin time um, and also can can affect baby's willingness to latch and willingness to feed um, babies who have been suctioned a lot sometimes uh, don't want anything near their mouths or don't, uh, don't yeah just have a, a sensory issue and so um, latching can sometimes be difficult in the first couple of days and that's really the important time for setting breastfeeding up is really those first few days of life um, and really having a good start. So anything that dis disrupts that that early skin to skin time, uh, including um, an assisted birth, can can affect supply in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, and with C sections and with you know any births that are more complicated or needing oxytocin or um, an epidural, IV fluids can also delay delay milk coming in. Usually we see that happen by about a day. Um, and there is a correlation of the amount of IV fluid used to the amount of weight that the baby loses because they're losing water weight. Um, if any of you have had IV fluids, you may have noticed some swelling in your own feet. That goes away. Um, the same thing happens for your baby. But that leads to us thinking that there's a greater um, greater weight loss than there might have been if the baby hadn't had been exposed to those IV fluids, if their weight wasn't artificially inflated by the IV fluids. Um, so those, again, are things that can lead to early supplementation, which in turn lowers milk supply because it's a supply and demand process. And if, if you're supplementing, your baby isn't necessarily at the breast unless you're using an at-breast supplementer. Um, so that can complicate things as well. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing around birth, one of the other things around birth that can affect um, supply down the road are pain medications. Um, and so depending on the pain medications used can depend on how willing and able your baby will be to latch after the birth. Um, some medications that are given during labor can pass through to the baby. So any of the narcotics can pass through to the baby. So sometimes babies come out just a little bit stoned and not really... Um, uh, energetic enough to be able to get a good latch and to be able or to show interest even in latching in that first hour which is really really critical in setting up breastfeeding um, and so uh, when you're thinking of your birth plan and thinking of how you're going to manage your pain um, or discomfort um, just keep in mind that lactation piece too uh, it's not to say that you shouldn't have any pain medications in labor at all it's not at all what we're saying it's just uh, sometimes we do have to kind of struggle to get babies interested in the breast in the in the early early postpartum mm -hmm. um, and the last thing we're going to talk about surrounding circumstances of birth is retained placenta so um, in order to make milk, your body has to get the placenta out. That triggers the the first bit of milk production, um, as it triggers your body transitioning colostrum into mature milk. So it's really important that that whole placenta comes out. Um, and oftentimes, if a piece of placenta gets left in the uterus, we will see women struggling to produce enough milk. So that's one of the things we really check to make sure placentas appear complete. But if you've ever looked at a placenta, um, you know, <laughs> it only takes a piece the size of an eraser head to to hang around in there and cause problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so next we'll move on to issues with babes. So sometimes babies have anatomical issues that can interfere with breastfeeding. And the most common one, and one that we're seeing really, really more often these days, is tongue tie. So tongue tie or lip tie. So tongue tie is when there's a small piece of skin from the base of the tongue attaching to the roof of the mouth. And what it can do, depending on the severity, is it can affect the way the baby can move their tongue. Babies need their tongues to be able to move freely in order to get a really, really um, good latch and in order to transfer the milk. So the really big thing is tra the transfer of milk. So babies use their tongues in really fantastic ways when they're nursing. And I Have you seen that video? video? We, should, we should share it <laughs> if they haven't it. shared it yet. <laughs> so they've done ultrasounds of babies nursing at the breast and they've really shown this like really beautiful kind of waveform pattern of the tongue as it compresses the breast to be able to move the milk forward. And so um, oftentimes if the tongue is tied and they don't have good mobility in their tongue, then they won't be able to move that milk as well. And so you're thinking, well, they're at the breast, you know, I'm feeding them 12 times a day, but if they're not gaining well and they don't have good output, but it could be that something's going on in their mouth. Um, my first had a, a complicated tongue tie, a posterior tongue tie, and so it was quite challenging to get um, a good diagnosis and to get uh, to get it fixed in order for him to have to be able to to do the job he needed to do. He still nursed for four years, so we're good. <laughs> we got over that part. Um, and lip ties can sometimes get in the way, although I find that they stretch. And and I'm in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go to a, a special conference on lip and tongue ties so I might have more to say about it down the road maybe we'll do a whole Facebook live on that <laughs> okay, tongue ties. it is becoming more common we are seeing it and there are lots of theories out there about why um, but uh, we're still waiting for concrete evidence before we can figure out how we can manage the um, the tongue tie epidemic it's a good word <laughs> um, cleft lip and palates are are also um, anatomical issues for the baby that can come up. Um, so sometimes we see them on ultrasound, but not always, um, often not. And they, um, there are special feeders to help those babies um, mm -hmm. nurse or eat um, because they have a hard time latching on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not common that we see, and these are really, really special circumstances. Mm -hmm. There are babies that are born with other issues in the mouth, um, placement of the palate or uh, just the structure of their chin and their mouth. Um, we don't see other problems commonly, um, but uh, we can certainly help to identify the issues and, and help get uh, specialists involved. There are um, lots and lots and lots of um, lactation consultants out around, certainly in the Brockville area, <laughs> but around, uh, especially in the to be able to help look for your local um, Lactation consultant, if you're if you're concerned or have any issues with, or if you're worried about any mouth stuff for babies, um, and then there's there uh, are issues with mums. So there are some mums who um, have uh, aren't able to make a, enough milk for their babies for lots of specific reasons. Um, uh, first, we'll talk about breast reductions. So. The um, breast reductions can certainly affect the tissue in the breasts and the way that milk moves through the breasts. Uh, so we call this BFAR, breastfeeding after reduction. I am a BFAR mom. I had a breast reduction when I was 17, so I was still in high school, and I wasn't really thinking about breastfeeding when I was 17, with other things on my mind. Um, uh, and so I struggled um, feeding all of my kids and, and certainly needed to supplement my first. Um, uh, and so de it depends on the type of reduction that was done, it depends on the type of surgery, and it depends on the type of damage to the tissues that may have been done. So one of the important pieces, uh, sometimes we think it's only the ducts, right? So ducts that lead from where the milk is made to be able to bring the milk down to the nipple for the baby. Um, those can sometimes be cut or injured in a, in a surgery, but there's also the neurological piece too. So there are nerves that innervate our breasts and and if the signal's not getting to the brain because those nerves have been, nerves have been damaged um, then again you're not going to have the same letdown you're not going to have the same supply um, just because the messages are, aren't getting to your breast um, breast reductions are it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't breastfeed it often is a challenge with your first baby in the beginning um, but it doesn't mean it's always going to be a challenge with all of your babies mm -hmm. every time you breastfeed and the longer you breastfeed the more your breast can heal from a surgery um, and recanalization you'll you'll have more ducts that will open up you'll have um, your body will just figure out how to get the milk uh, from breasts into your baby um, and so it does get easier over time don't give up 
um, for those. And just because you had a breast reduction doesn't mean you don't have the choice to breastfeed. I remember going to a conference with Dr. Jack Newman, who is, uh, I would say, our Canadian breastfeeding expert. Um, and he said, um, you know, putting your baby to the breast isn't just about feeding your baby, it's about the connection too. And so there are lots of different ways to feed your baby. And if you're not able to fully feed your baby from your own milk, you can still breast feed your baby at the breast with um, a supplemental nursing system. And Becky and I both have a lot of experience <laughs> with that. And, uh, uh, you know, are, are happy to talk about that and um, and, and help other clients out with that. If you mm -hmm. um, so in a similar way, um, insufficient glandular tissue or hypoplastic breasts, which essentially means that the tissue didn't develop um, in puberty or sometimes in the womb, um, those initial initial steps didn't happen. Um, I just got a little battery sign. That's, uh, that's all. But we'll finish this up and if, then if we'll you lose do us, another one. If you lose us, it's the battery. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so insufficient glandular tissue, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, which means once everything else has been rolled out, which is really challenging to do with lactation, um, people will often hear insufficient glandular tissue or IGT sort of bat around as a, as a possible diagnosis or a possible cause of, of low milk supply. There is not a whole lot of research into this. We don't really know why it happens. Um, the incidence rate, it seems to happen somewhere between one percent but although we're seeing more underdeveloped breasts um, and I'll talk about why that might be later um, so there are some physical indicators of IGT but it's not um, they're not diagnostic so some people with all of the physical indicators so um, breasts that are more triangular shaped or appear to be missing tissue or feel like they're missing tissue um, or oftentimes there's a herniation around the nipple um, or widely spaced breasts, not having any growth during pregnancy uh, or puberty. Those are all physical indications, but you could have all of those and still make a full milk supply, and you could have none of them and not have enough milk. Um, so IGT is sort of a, a beast of, it takes a long time to figure out why, why milk isn't happening. Um, and it can, be, it can be really upsetting when that's happening. Um, we'll post a, a blog with more information about IGT if people are curious. The next reason that's somewhat related to IGT or the underdevelopment of breasts is insulin dysregulation. So we're seeing a lot more um, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes in our younger populations these days, largely due to a North American diet um, and a sedentary lifestyle. Um, so there is a lot of new research coming out about insulin dysregulation or insulin resistance in breastfeeding. Um, we used to think that what, so insulin's role is to help cells take up glucose, take up the sugar in your blood. Um, and that's good to an extent. We want our bodies to do that because it's how we feed our bodies and keep our bodies going. Um, but when that's happening too often, when there's too much sugar in the blood, your body keeps pumping out insulin um, and eventually the cells stop responding to it. And that can turn into diabetes. So that's how people develop type two diabetes typically. Um, we used to think that uh, insulin wasn't very important for breastfeeding because milk um, in the breasts, glucose isn't absorbed into the cells by insulin. It's through a different process, but we're now discovering that insulin plays a different role entirely, but we're not entirely clear what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery of the <Yes>. body. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, so. Oh, do you, are you finished? Talking? Almost. Okay. What we know from mouse studies is that particular cells in breast tissue have to remain sensitive to insulin in order to develop properly and to make enough milk. And most of the galacticogs that we talk about are, are herbs and supplements to increase milk supply, actually lower your blood sugar. So there's, we're wondering if there's some correlation between that and the scientific community. Mm -hmm. There are other health issues too that can affect our milk supply. Um, any thyroid issues, so hyper or hypothyroid, which is also I'm finding more and more common mm -hmm. these days. Um, and I don't know why. I will maybe look into some research about why. <laughs> um, but uh, an underactive or an overactive um, thyroid can can affect our hormonal supply. So uh, we know that our milk supply and breastfeeding is really, really importantly based on the hormones oxytocin and prolactin. So prolactin is the hormone that's primarily in charge of making milk and oxytocin is the hormone 
primarily in charge of releasing the milk um, and and that letdown. And so with issues with with um, your thyroid, it can affect the regulation of oxytocin and prolactin, which can affect your supply uh, in different ways. Sometimes uh, an oversupply, sometimes an undersupply, and sometimes everything is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and related to insulin resistance is PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. So oftentimes folks with PCOS have insulin resistance as part of their diagnosis because of how the hormone cascade works with PCOS. Um, but one third of people will have low supply who have PCOS, a third will have normal supply, and a third will have an oversupply. So <laughs> just because you have PCOS does not mean that you cannot breastfeed or that you will automatically have a low milk supply. Um, there's an important cascade of hormones that happens with um, lactation that can be disrupted by hormonal imbalances in folks with PCOS. So um, that's that's kind of PCOS. Mm. There's there's more information about it. We'll put it in the blog post. But, yeah. yeah. Wow, PCOS. So I had PCOS and a breast reduction. Could I still manage to have babies and breastfed them? Yeah, it's one of those things <laughs> that milk supply is. There's often a lot of confounding factors with low milk supply. So it's tricky to figure out what needs to be fixed in order to, to help milk flow. Um, so I think next time we'll chat a bit more about um, sort of remedies and action plans and what you can do if, if you just never develop a full milk supply. Um, so what's important is what we the factors that can affect your milk supply, um, these are the things that you can try, right? You, and we'll talk more about them the next time, but making sure that you've got lots of skin to skin time with your baby, that you're allowing your baby to get to the breast as possible as often as they want, um, and, uh, and really protecting that, um, that time, that, that early newborn time, so that early postpartum is really a time to get to your baby to bed, snuggle with your baby skin to skin, and breastfeed all the time. That's your only job, should be your only job mm -hmm. in the first few weeks anyway. So if anyone, so next time we come on, or one of us will come on <laughs> and, uh, and talk a little bit more about how to fix low milk supply. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments um, you would like to address for the next um, chat, then, then please send them to us. We will, uh, we're always happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, right. everyone. Bye Have guys, a great sorry. day. Yeah, maybe. Oh, maybe mm, we're super no. high. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we want to.